welcome to Naples First Church of the Nazarene. What a beautiful morning in Southwest Florida, amen. Now I know that we have some first time visitors here. If you're a first time visitor, could you raise your hand this morning? Praise the Lord, let's welcome our visitors. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. And we trust that the Lord will touch and speak to you as you open your heart to Him today. Now we have some announcements for you this morning. First of all, this morning and immediately after the worship service, we will be conducting our annual elections for the church board. And so we ask that all members stay for that short meeting and we will get our business conducted and have you out of here as quickly as possible. Next Sunday, February the 16th, we will be receiving the Alabaster Offering. But we have a short video about that for you this morning. In a small town, a group of 30 people meet to worship in an evening service. It's cold out, and the single room where they meet is heated by a small wood stove in the corner. There is only a little bit of room left by the time that everyone crowds in and has a seat. Worship songs are sung from sheets of paper passed around the room in the aid of a single guitar. When finished, they say a word of prayer and the pastor brings a small wooden box to the front of the room that is shaped like a church building. He explains, we have a tradition of giving what's called an alabaster offering together. It goes towards helping buy properties and buildings that are used for ministry all around the world. Sometimes it goes towards church buildings, sometimes schools or hospitals, and sometimes other properties that support missionary work. Basically, the alabaster offering is all of us chipping in with other churches for properties that are needed for the kingdom. When the offering is given, adults and children alike come up to drop their offerings into the small slot on the roof of the box. The kids are excited to drop the small coins that they have been saving for the occasion and like to hear the sound that it makes. The pastor prays that God would bless this offering to the building of the kingdom around the world. Months go by. The weather turns warmer, and the meetings carry on as they have. One Sunday, the pastor preaches about the power of prayer. And towards the end of the service, he reaches behind the makeshift pulpit and gets out of the small box. He says, now I want to encourage you. Do you remember when we gave an offering in the box last winter and prayed that it would go towards God's work around the world? Well, it did. Our alabaster offering, along with the offering of many other churches, has gone towards a new church building in Botswana, Africa. Our prayer was answered, and so was the prayer of the church that is going to be used in that building. I think it's great that we were a part of that. And there's something else. This might be upsetting to some of you that have grown attached to meeting here, but we are going to be meeting here much longer. You see, our district superintendent called me last week and let me know that our church is going to be receiving alabaster funds to purchase a place of our own. It won't be long before we're in a place with some room to grow. These funds also go to build medical facilities and parsonages all over the world. Now, in both foyers, front and back, we have these boxes. You can pick up one of these boxes on the way out, throw your spare change in this throughout the week, and let it accumulate. We also have in the pockets of the chairs in front of you these envelopes. You can pick one of these up, and if you want to write a check and pop it in the envelope, designated for alabaster offering that will be received next Sunday morning.
The following week, on February 23rd, our very own Rachel Vasquez will be sharing a testimony for Faith Promise Sunday. And as most of you know, Rachel uh, went through a double lung transplant uh, several months back and is doing very well. Would you stand, Rachel? We're so glad to have her here with us today. <laughs> Uh, now our Faith Promise Sunday, we're given an opportunity to pledge an amount over and above our tithe to support Nazarene World Missions for the coming year. And, you know, we're all called to fulfill the Great Commission. We're all called to be missionaries. Some are called to be goers and others are called to be senders. And so let's ask the Lord what He would have each of us do and then simply obey Him his abundant blessing, I promise you, will be poured out upon us. Also, on Monday, February 24th, the ninth annual Ride Nature <laughs> Fundraising Banquet will be held at Summit Church University Campus in Fort Myers, Florida from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. As most of you know, Pastor Mark and Lisa Cook's son, Mark Anthony, along with his wife, Shannon, started this ministry to reach out to the action sports subculture around the world with the life-changing hope of Jesus Christ. And this ministry has been phenomenally successful. Uh, there will be a wonderful meal, a ministry update, and an inspirational message. The cost is $25 per person, but we have some donors who have already sponsored seats so it's free to any of you who would like to attend and learn more about this effective ministry. If you're interested, please see me in the foyer, in the front foyer, right after the service, or text me or phone me this week. Last but not least, on March the 26th through the 29th, Trebekah Nazarene University will be hosting TNT for the youth. The cost is $250 per person due by February 12th. If you have any questions about that, please see Ken and Denise Main for details. Now you may be tempted to think nearly every single one of these announcements was about someone looking for donations. <laughs> I can stand before you this morning and confidently <laughs> present these needs because each one of these great ministries are really opportunities to exercise our faith in and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ in a tangible, real way. And I know firsthand the faithfulness, the power, and the blessing of God on those who respond to Him. I know many of you do too. If you do, say amen. 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 British missionary C.T. Studd, 1860 to 1931, famously said, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's so true. Amen. Amen. Well, is anybody else besides me here today pumped up from revival last week? Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand if you are. If you stand with us this morning, we're going to read from Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13. And uh, be thinking, because I'm going to open up and take maybe two, maybe three testimonials today about how the Lord touched you in the revival. And uh, uh, if we don't get to everyone who would like to share a testimony this week, we'll share some more next week. Let's read together Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Amen. Who would like
like to share a testimony? How did the Lord touch you during our revival last week? I was touched because I thought it was quite um, a lesson for us uh, to hear in another language uh, God's words. Amen. And so it was a challenge to listen to the interpreter and what he was having to say to us and apply it to our own hearts. So I got a blessing from that. Amen. Much like an experience you get on a, a work and witness trip on the mission field. Amen. Yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, praise the Lord. Think about that, and next week we'll open it up one more time. But uh, I was reminded uh, by one of our saints here of an old hymn that kind of described what last weekend was like for me. And the name of that hymn is Heaven Came Down. Hymn number 371. Uh, if you prefer to use the hymnal, they're on the shelf uh, underneath the chair in front of you. Or the words will be up on the overhead as well. But indeed, heaven did come down upon us. Amen. We had a visitation from the Spirit of God. It was really a wonderful time. So let's sing this morning. Are you ready to worship? Amen. Amen.
Listen to the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen to this verse. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I would open the altar this morning and then read through our worship folder. You see so many prayer requests and many that we've heard about during the week. And uh, I just like opening the altar and giving an opportunity to pray. We come boldly, it tells us. We come to thank God for His provision and His protection and His love. And uh, we come for continued spirit of revival. And I like that last part of the verse. It says, we find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to come to the altar, I'd invite you to do so. And I want to read three verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And uh, what a wonderful passage. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. If you'd like to come to the altar, I would encourage you to come and uh, bring your petitions and, and uh, requests to the Lord. Praise the Lord for His presence here today. Amen. Would you take a moment and thank God for His provisions in your life? We're told in Scripture that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. He has been so good to us. We are blessed beyond measure. We just read that we have a high priest that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It means he knows what we're going through. He knows what we're going through physically, spiritually, and emotionally. He knows what our families are going through. And he's there to help. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for such a high priest. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this altar. We thank you for the privilege of praying today. We thank you, Lord, that we can look back on our lives and see so many times you have provided just what you needed. So many times you have protected us. So many times you have given us your love and your grace and your mercy. And we give you praise. Lord, we thank you for being with our country this week. And we continue to pray for our leaders and our government, our president, vice president, and Congress, and, and uh, all the, those who have control over us and who lead us. We pray for this virus that is going around the world, that we pray that there be a cure that will be found for that, Lord. We pray for our soldiers that are in different, difficult places today, Lord, and uh, some from this church, and we just pray, dear God, that you would, you would help them and keep your hand on them. We love you today, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your blessings, and we pray that each one of us would have a new moving of your Holy Spirit in our lives today. Have your way in every part of this service, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for this altar and for those who have knelt here this morning. Thank you for those who are standing and saying, Lord, this is just what I need. I invite you to come and have your way in my life. We love you today, Lord, and thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our ushers are going to 
come and serve us and we will worship the Lord through our giving. By the way, I wanted to make a comment. Thank you so much for your generous gift of uh, for revival for, for Brother Orge and his family. I saw $2,000 was given last week and I may say praise the Lord for that one. Thank you.
pastor. Well, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Yeah. And man, I also enjoyed the revival last week with Brother Jorge and uh, what a wonderful, wonderful sermon. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to you that I'm going to begin a series of sermons on the church, what it is and what it can be. And uh, I want to begin by telling you that I fell in love with the church when I was just a child, maybe 10 or 11. <coughs> Childhood memories include vacation Bible school, Sunday school class picnics, youth meetings, youth choir, Bible quizzing, and church camp, and more. But more than the activities and the events was the love that I and my family experienced there at the church. I felt love there. I made friends there that are still friends today. I was shown kindness there. I learned to read scripture there. I enjoyed the singing. I learned how to pray there. I mentioned to you before that I grew up in southern Kentucky and Appalachia, Monticello, Kentucky, and the church was a big part of our life. It centered around it. I occasionally see people today that wear a t-shirt or have a bumper sticker that says, I love my church. When I see them saying that, I come right up to them and say, I love my church too. <laughs> and it has been so good. And uh, I want to say, praise the Lord, I do too. There's so many reasons why we love the church. It's the creation of the Holy Spirit. It's the bride of Christ. It is the hands and feet and voice of Christ. And I love the church because it is going to win out in the end. Amen. Someday we will be worshiping Jesus around the throne. Amen. And that's why we're willing to pour our lives <coughs> out into the church. We're going to be winning. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he also said, nothing can stand against it. Not even death or hell itself. Satan has tried to destroy and harm the church. He thought if he could kill Jesus, the church wouldn't be built. But Jesus came out of the grave. And uh, throughout history, some have tried to stamp out the church. Emperors and kings have tried to uh, persecute it and kill members of the church. But persecution has not killed the church of Jesus Christ. He, in John chapter 6, we read these words, I will raise him up in the last day. The church is eternal. And one of the reasons I want to pour my life into the church is that Jesus is building it. And Satan's most powerful weapon, death, could not stop it. Nothing will be able to separate us from his love. I will be there one of these days, gathered with you around the throne, and saying, Holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to read the scripture together. Would you stand and let's read together this morning. The scriptures that I have chosen today are about our love for Christ and his church. Let's read together. And now, Israel... What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Next. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of Him who holds the seven stars in His right hand, and walks among the seven golden half-stands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of God, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Thank you for standing in. You may be, may be seated. By the way, how many of you have a GPS that is either with your phone or in your car? Would you just raise your hand? Well, one thing I really love about a GPS is how it corrects my mistakes. Sometimes she, in my GPS, is a woman. She tells me to turn right, but I was distracted. I was in the left lane. So I mess up, and I miss the turn. The GPS will say, recalculating, recalculating. And when she says recalculating, I get the message, Joey, you messed up. But don't worry, I'll get you there. It's going to take a little more time, but I'll get you there. You know, I thought about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's done for us all of our lives. We made a wrong decision. We take a wrong turn. We mess things up. But the voice of the Spirit says, don't worry. I'll get you back on track. And if we listen, the Holy Spirit will get us where God wants us to be. Praise the Lord. And uh, when I think of that, I think of the scripture that we just read. And when I read those scriptures, it, it makes me want to turn up the flame in my own soul about my love for the Lord and His church. And I can almost hear the Spirit prompting and, and saying, Joey, I want you to turn up the flame of your, your love for me. John, I want you to turn up the flame of your love and the lo Lord and His church. And, congregation and board members and Sunday school teachers and senior citizens and youth and I want you to turn up the flame of your love for the Lord and His Spirit. And there's times in our life when God calls us to turn up the flame and to rekindle the flame and to reignite our love for Christ and His church. It's time to pray the fire back down in our hearts. It's time to raise the temperature of our love for the Lord. One day a man walks up to Jesus and says, Lord, what's the most important thing that I can do to make it to heaven? And Jesus talked to him about the commandments, and he says, you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, it is it's like the Lord is saying, I want you to love me passionately. Passionately. Nothing else matters in life if you don't love God passionately. God doesn't want you to love him half-heartedly. He wants you to love Him with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. Yes. I love this phrase in Matthew chapter 12, excuse me, Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. From the message it says this, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy and heart. Put some energy in your love. Don't be half-hearted. Give it all you've got. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, do it with passion. You've got to give it some oomph, some spark, some zip, some enthusiasm, some zest. And, and uh, I want you, Lord, to reignite the passion of my heart for you. We're passionate about many things. We won't be going home watching the Super Bowl tonight. That was last Sunday night. But you saw people, how passionate they were about their team and people you talk with and the, the expressions they, they have there. And... and um, when this verse says, love me with all of your energy and all of your heart. We're passionate about many things. We're passionate about music and sports and travel and art and fashion and gardening and NASCAR and you name it. We're, we're passionate about all of these things. But what we're looking at today and focusing on is turning up the passion, the fire of passion for Jesus. Let's turn up the fire of passion for the church. 
We're called to keep the fires burning brightly in our souls for Jesus. It's not automatic. But I want to tell you, I'm blessed and I'm admired when I look at some of the senior citizens of the church who were saved at a young age and now up in later years. And I am a senior citizen now and I, I know that. But one of the things that blesses me is to see some seniors that have had a passionate fire burning in their hearts for many, many years. Share that with your family. Share that with your kids and with your grandkids. Share that in your Sunday school class. Share that in, in church service. Stand up and testify to the privilege of, of being on fire for with passion for the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. We keep the fires burning brightly in our souls for Jesus. It's not automatic. I've also seen some of our youth get on fire spiritually at youth camp or, or retreats or or TNT and come back all charged up. And I just say, don't lose the fire. Keep serving the Lord. I remember I was a sophomore in, in high school and I went to what's called Nazarene Youth Congress, back, that International Institute back then, but it's Nazarene Youth Congress. And, and the, the evangelist had just preached about sanctification and about giving yourself to the Lord completely. And I, he told us all to go find a big rock. This was in uh, Estes Park, Colorado. He said, go find a big rock and pray there. And then he said, give yourself your whole life to Jesus. And I remember doing that. Paul Martin was the evangelist. And some of you may remember, remember Paul Martin. But I went to a place there. And I, I found a place to pray. And forever the direction of my life was changed. When, when the, I said, Lord, I'm yours. And whatever you want me to do. I remember going back to my home church and sharing with them that, that the Lord had done something special for me and that I was going to serve Him. And, and people came around and they said, we're going to be praying for you. And thank the Lord that, that the church prays for its young people and its children and its young adults. And, and even though we may not see the same things the, the way, we may see, we, we may like different music or we may like different sports or whatever it is, but we're one in the body of, in the body of Christ. And uh, praise the Lord that we can do that. C.S. Lewis made this statement. And uh, he said, The only thing Christianity not, cannot be in your life is moderately important. Amen. It is not just, uh, just something that we say. And uh, Jesus would talk to the church of Laodicea. He gave them a warning, and we read about it in, in uh, the scriptures there, Revelations 2. It was the warning not to be lukewarm. Do you know what the worst sin is for Christians? It's not adultery, it's not murder, it's not lying. But in Revelation, God tells us it's lukewarmness. No passion. God is just one of the things in my life. I have my social life, and my career life, and my sexual life, and my family life, and over here is a bit of little bit of a pie called the church and God says how dare you I love you this much I love you enough that I I made you and I created you and I planned you and I purposed you and I saved you and I have a place in heaven for you and I went to the cross and died for you and I shed my blood for, for you and will you respond to me with half-heartedness half-hearted indifference excuse me there's a good TV show on tonight God and I can't go to church tonight C.S. Lewis, when you're making this st statement, he said to us, the truth is you can get as close to God as you choose to be. You can have as much of God as you want. You can be as passionate about God as you want. And my question is, uh, how is your passion for Jesus? Are you lukewarm? Are you just going through the motions? Or are you red hot for God because He loves you that much to die for you? Has there ever been a time in your life when you're closer to God than you are now? If so, why? Don't hold back. The truth is, choose to be close to the Lord. We read a passage in Deuteronomy, Old Testament. What does God ask of you? Deuteronomy 10, 12. One, to fear Him. Fear the Lord your God. We do that. Two, walk in obedience to Him. Number three, to love Him. What does God ask of you? To love Him. And then to serve Him with all of your heart. And with all of, of your soul. And uh, Jesus talks to a church about its love for him diminishing. You know, and I look at this at Ephesus. But I want you to know some of the things that he commends in this church. 
He commends them, number one, for hard work and perseverance. They're, they're really good about getting things done. And uh, number two, they cannot tolerate sin. They love holiness. And, and we love holiness. And, and we don't want to be involved in sin. And, and the third thing is they were doctrinally sound. They would discover false teachers when they come. And, and the fourth is they had persevered and endured hardships. And fifth, they have not grown weary. Wouldn't you like to be a part of that church, all of that church? But Jesus said with his big heart breaking, you don't love me like you used to love me. Wow. He said that to the whole church. By the way, you can read the book of Acts. You can see how the Ephesian church was born. And Paul and his ministry there, they had this great big rival. The people brought all their idols and had a big bonfire. And, and all of these things happened. And Ephesus was, was booming and a great revival had been there. But now between that time and the time when Jesus is walking among the seven churches, he looks at Ephesus and says, something's missing. You don't love me like you used to. And um, how important it is that when we see Jesus with his big heart breaking, and don't you love me like you did at first, the truth is, as churches get older, I believe that periodically God wants us to put it all back on the altar again. And we want to demonstrate a fresh wave of, of love to God. We need a restoring of the first love. We need a rekindling of the fire of devotion and love to Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times over the, over the 45 years of pastoring that I would go into the church and I would kneel at the altar and thank God for all that we have. And I would just pray, Lord, I need a new touch. I need a new move of your spirit in my soul. And I've learned that it is not just about going through the motions. It is about coming to the altar and putting my time there and putting my money there and putting my talent there, and putting my body there and everything that I have. And I say, Lord, it's yours. It's yours. And I love the course we sang more than anything. Is it true? Do we love him more than anything? Can we say amen to that? Amen, amen. amen. With, with all of our heart. Um, as churches get older and uh, we are to put it back on the altar and we need to demonstrate a fresh love, a wave of love uh, to God. And we need a restoring of the first love and a rekindling of the fire of devotion and love to Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe that the Lord wants us to rekindle our love for Him in a new and, and fresh way. And uh, there's nothing more powerful in the world, no greater light in the darkness than a church of people in whom Jesus dwells and who are, listen to this, who are deeply, passionately, devotedly, sacrificially in love with Him above everything else. A church not going through the motions, but rather is rendering service while completely giving herself over to the, to the Lord and, and His consuming love. You see, we can easily be distracted. Jude warns, Keep yourselves in the love of God. He talks about sensual living. He talks about false doctrine. He talks about people that are going after their own interest and lust, not having the spirit. Edmund Burke says this, Very seldom does a man take one giant step from a life of virtue and goodness into the life of vice and corruption. Usually it begins his journey into evil by taking little steps into shaded areas. Areas tinted and colored just a bit, almost unnoticed by those around him. Until one day, hardly aware that he's made this journey, he finds himself firmly entangled in a life of sin and self. We see that kind of journey again and again in Scripture. I want to take a moment to talk to you about the tragic lives of, Sam, uh, of Samson and, uh, and Saul. How many of you know a little bit who Samson was? Raise your hand. You, you heard a little bit about Samson in the book of Judges. And I went over and read those about six chapters about the life of Samson again. And, and uh, he was born, and when he was, when he was born, an angel had appeared to his mother who, and told, him you're, told her that you're going to have a child. And, and she didn't believe it, and, uh, but, but you're going to have a child, and he's going to be special. And you're not going to ever cut his hair. And, and the, you've heard of Nazarites. And, and they're not never to drink alcohol. 
They're never to touch a dead body. And they, the judges were, this was a time when there was no king in Israel, and the judges were the ones that the nation looked up to. And Samson, uh, we know his story. He was a man of God. From birth to manhood, manhood, his life was dedicated to God. He started in the morning with God, and he spent the whole day with God. He ended his, eat, his day with God. But Samuel, excuse me, Samson, uh, become gradually flirting with evil. And little by little, evil came into his life. And you can read in, in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, one of the most startling verses in all the Bible. It says that the Lord departed from Samson, and Samson didn't realize it. Wow. Isn't that sad? This one who had been the spiritual leader of, of the nation, and uh, this one who had... Who had uh, uh, kept all the vows and so forth, but now Samson had become so enmeshed in sin that God couldn't stand to stay around anymore, so God left him. And Samson, once a great man of God, was so insensitive to the presence of God that when God left him, he didn't even recognize he was gone. That was true of King Saul, too. The sun comes up on his life, and he, we see a cloudless sky, a beautiful beginning for Saul. He's a man who loves God and, and uh, who God loves. But gradually he turns his back on God and the storm clouds begin to collect. And finally he can't see the sun anymore because God has left him. And the Bible says that Saul ended up slinking off to a witch in Endor, seeking help from the powers of evil because those were the forces that were now controlling his life. It had begun with a heart growing cold, losing the fire of communion with the Father and his, his love then. Uh, his love was gone and he, he's increased his life in wickedness. And how many would grow old? How do you recover when you've made some mistakes? The scripture tells us these are the way. First, remember what it was like. Remember the blessing. Remember the times that you got in the car and listened to Christian radio and you get blessed and sometimes would have to pull over to the side of the road because your tears are coming down and you think how good God has been to you. And how many things he's done for you. And, and uh, you remember. And you repent. And you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, 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 I blew it with my wife. I blew it with this with a temper. I, I had this to happen. And I I've, uh, went through some temptations that, that I didn't come through the, the way I should have. And, and uh, what begins to happen then is you repent. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. Then you return. And then you redo the first works. There's a, the church in Ephesus. <laughs> that we were talking about. It was dedicated, it was determined, and, and it was disciplined. And, uh, but it came, it came a point to where they, they began to love other things more than they love Christ. In reality, the Christian life is about loving Jesus. It is about loving Him deeply, passionately, totally. It is about loving Him sacrificially. It is about loving Him obediently. It is about loving Him worshipfully. It is about serving Him. And it's about loving Jesus Christ more than anything else. And uh, how important it is that we understand that being a Christian is about loving Christ so much that you want to know Him, that you want to exalt Him, that you want to please Him, you want to serve Him, you want to be with Him so much that you want to tell others about Him. It's about this overwhelming, consuming affection for Christ. That is the core of what it means to be a Christian. We want to be like Jesus Amen. and to be with Him more yes. and more. But in Ephesus, the thrill was gone. The enthusiasm was drying out. When this happens, the church becomes mundane. Other interests will attract us. Eyes will be taken off of Jesus. Some backslide to their old flame self. Ephesus was a busy church that had lost its joy and lost its love. It was hard, a hard-working church, but, it lo but love was missing. They were no longer resting. They were striving. They had fallen from a great height of grace. They were known for their works and their love. Paul had prayed for them so many times. And we read this incredible story. And we're reminded that hard work is not enough. Sacrifice is not enough. Doctrine of purity was not enough. Fine pastoral oversight was not enough. Perseverance was not enough. What would be necessary is to maintain and rekindle the love that we have in our hearts for Him. Wow. 
it's possible for a church to lose out. But in reality, however, we, we forsake and we, we choose. And uh, the Lord calls us to repent of forsaking our first love, meaning that we can be restored to a place of spiritual passion by the choices we make and the lifestyle we ad adopt. Dr. Hoss Guinness writes this. He said, personal development has now grown substitute for conversion. Results have, have ousted fruit as the yardstick of success, and the criteria of ministry is no longer worship and fellowship. Instead, it is a self-perpetuating series of conventions, cons consultations, and committees in flooding the Christian world with this message that this is the way. And how important that we understand that it's not just about the meeting, it is about loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you love me? Lord, I love your work. I love your music. I love your people. I love to be needed. I love to be worn out, tired, admired, exhausted, and efficient. Do you love me? Well, I love to sing. I love to preach. I love to worship in an exciting church. Do you love me? No, Lord, I'm not even sure that I know you anymore. Then now, child, come over here. And let's spend some time praying together. And I will teach you how to love and how to live. You probably heard this story, but it's, it's worth repeating. And uh, there's an elderly couple who were driving to church one Sunday morning. And they were each sitting in their corner of the front seat when they noticed a young couple in the car in front of them. The girl sitting as close as she could get to the guy. The wife turned to her husband and said, Honey, why don't we sit close to each other in the car the way we used to? Her husband returned to her and answered, I haven't moved. <laughs> He'd been steering behind the steering wheel all these years while she had moved to the other side of the seat. Sometimes we have similar conversations with God. We say to Him, Lord, remember when we used to be so close? Remember when we had this great relationship and we were so excited about ministry and alive with passion? And He answered us, I haven't moved. I've been here all along. But you've slipped away through the years. The solution to repent and to return and, and regain the first love. I think I might have lost that one. But uh, I want to talk to you about Christ coming to see Simon Peter. Simon Peter, thank the Lord, he's in, his story's in the scripture. And uh, when uh, after, after crucifixion and uh, Simon Peter goes back fishing, and the Lord had called him to be a fisherman, the Lord had called him from being a fisherman to come and follow him. and. And Peter had bragged, you know, when, when uh, he said he'd never deny him. You know the story about the rooster crowing and, and so forth. And now, now he's gone back to his, his uh, career. He's gone back to fishing. And um, the Lord comes up to him and he asks him this question. And this is the question that is so important. He uh, sees that Peter has his boat and his nets and some helpers that are right around there. And... And the Lord, looking around, and he sees all that Peter has going, and he, and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And uh, Peter had declared himself that he was more dedicated to Jesus than anybody else. Peter, do you love me more than these? It was a question Jesus has every right to ask. When the chips are down, did Peter really love him more than his boat and his job, more than the other disciples? Did he just love them when there were miracles and people thronging? And, or did he love him enough to give his life, his future, his whole being to him? There's fish in the nets there. It represents the old life. Everything that Peter had to follow Jesus. Everything that he had left to follow Jesus. They represented another life, another choice, another path. And what are these in our lives? Is it your job, your family, the things that you want to own? Is it safety or secure life? Jesus didn't say, do you fear me? He didn't say, do you admire me? He didn't say, do you believe in me? He said, do you love me? 
Wow. A man felt called to the mission field. His fiance demanded not to go on the mission field. Came to see him off weeping. He said goodbye to her and flew away. In the church I pastor in Indiana, there was a lady that felt a call to the mission field and, and she was a member of our church. She told about being in one of our universities and she had fallen in love with this young man, but she had also fallen in love with missions. And uh, she talked to him and asked him where his position was, and he didn't want to go on the mission field. And uh, this lady went on to the mission field, and she spent her life in Argentina, Central America. And uh, the church that I pastored, when when she retired, she didn't have any money, and didn't have. Any, and the church that, that I was pastoring there, we bought her a house for her to live in the rest of her life. But she had made a decision years ago. I love Jesus more than anything in the world. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could, not with feeling guilt, if we could just turn up the flame in our own hearts and say, Lord, I want to let you know that I love you more than anything, anything there is in my life. And uh, if the love of the Lord if our love for the Lord isn't burning bright in our hearts, uh, we're missing out. And uh, I believe that today in this service, we are hearing the whisper. And the whisper is, Joey, musicians, church members, guests, I want you to turn up the flame of your love for the Lord and His church. It's time to rekindle the flame. There's a First in the Old Testament scripture says, never let, the, never let the fire burn out at the altar. They kept the fire going when, as people would bring their gifts to the, to the altar, to the priest. And I want to tell you, there's been so many times that I've gone, and I, I mentioned this, I've asked the Lord to reignite my love for Him and the church and to turn up the flame. And uh, I'd like for the... Uh, I'd like you to just bow your head just a moment, if you would, please. And uh, Lord, I want to thank you for Naples First Church of the Nazarene. I want to thank you for how you have blessed it, and I want to thank you for how it worked, how how hard people worked in this church, and the ministry that has taken place here at every age. And I thank you for the generosity that is here, and, and I thank you, Lord, for for the friendship and the fellowship that is here. I'm coming this morning to ask you to help us turn up the flame, to help us burn brighter with our love for Jesus. And may it never be said of us, uh, the said of Ephesus, that, that, that we become lukewarm. And I pray, dear God, that you'd help us to be the people that you'd, you'd have us to be. And right now, dear God, I pray that you'd just rekindle the flame in my own heart. And I pray for this congregation, Lord, that each one of us, even right now, will just declare, I do love you more than these. I love you more than everything else in my life. And I want to, I want to surrender once again to you completely, O oh Lord. How we love you today. Praise your name. I think, I think John, we're going to sing that course, I love you, Lord, now. I know we're going to sing it after the communion, but I feel led to, to come and do that now. And uh, will you stand with me, please? I want to tell you something about the altar. The altar is for God's people. It's a place where we can come and just say, Lord, I'm hearing that whisper in my heart. I'm hearing that GPS recalculating. You got off the track back here. Would you come? Keeping the spirit of revival alive. There may be some that would want to come up and kneel at the altar or stand at the altar, whichever is more comfortable for you. And just to say, Lord, I do love you. I love you, Lord. I love you more than anything else. And can we sing it with the depths of our heart and thank the Lord for the churches that have been a part of our lives. And can we say, meeting it in the depth of our, of our hearts, that we love you, Lord more than anything else. Couldn't do that, please. Would you lead us, Brother John, please?
open in the Church of the Nazarene. You do not need to be a member of this local church. You do not be a member, need to be a member of the Church of the Nazarene. It is a table for all the Christians who have asked Christ to save them and forgive them of their sins. And we come together. And we're going to have our servers to distribute the bread and the cup. And if you would just hold it, and we will all partake of it together. And as they're delivering the elements, let this be a time of self-examination and, and again, just reminding to the Lord that we love Him above everything else. And receive the elements as they come to you. You may serve at this time. Then he took the cup, 
and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Shall we drink together? I'd like to remind the members of this congregation that we will have a brief uh, annual meeting at the following the service today. Those that can vote in the election are members of this church, age 15 and older, and you're able to vote on the, this election. Shall we stand, please, and uh, sing in the course of a couple of years? Yeah. Jesus, I love you, yes, thank you. <coughs> Let's sing together this.
Bless you.